We put out our talk on the negative effects that deprived racks can have on the brains of ball pythons. We identified the problem, ball pythons struggling to adapt from breeder racks to pet home vivariums, and the cause, which is deprivation causing neural atrophy, but let's talk about the solution. To really move forward and build a big, new, shiny, progressive future for ball pythons, we really need to start from the baseline premise that racks are a compromise for ease of use and efficiency of space for commercial breeding. They are not and were never designed for the welfare of pet bull pythons. Freedom Breeder put out a video on YouTube about the history of their company and they themselves show the original marketing material. Remember you told me you started the whole rodent racks because you, you first had all the laboratory trays all over the ground with water bottles. And, yeah, I and couldn't food. go on vacation. So I, that's why I came up and started it with a rodent rack and then Tracy Barker, I sent her one and then flew me out there and wanted me to design the reptile cages and that's how it all started. Look at all those racks in there. Where was this? Was that in our garage? You will notice it's about space and efficiency and there's no mention of it being designed with bull pythons in mind. In fact, it's just marketing at snakes in general. Well, which species, ecology and natural history was a design trying to cater for? Just snakes in general. It's purely about space and efficiency no matter what species goes in there. So the intent for racks being used commercially is not and was not ever the intent for pet bull pythons to be kept like that. These two things should never be conflated. The science is clear, a deprived rack is detrimental to the long-term welfare of bull pythons. And a properly set up vivarium that allows opportunities to express different behaviours is the gold standard that is and should be encouraged to pet keepers. Any claim that the rack is the gold welfare standard for bull pythons is subject to the same situation I described as part of the rack feedback cycle, and thus comes from a place of misunderstanding or it's intentionally disingenuous. The overwhelming message is stop conflating what's best for the animal with what's best for commercial breeding. It's a compromise on welfare for space and efficiency. Own it. And this sentiment is recognized and shared by breeders too. Like it, it's, he, he's, he's bringing data and he's bringing facts, right? right? So then I see, the ball python world sort of like, well, not the whole world, but like some of them push back on it and rightfully so that this whole rack bullshit thing that they can't seem to get past. And um, that guy in his science say my drawers ain't <laughs> nice. <laughs> and that's exactly the point, right? You have, yeah. you have, you know, you have, I have to give it to Liam, right? He comes back and he goes point by point by what they're saying and is giving them data where the other knuckleheads are just blowing Yelling. bullshit yeah. because they want to keep yeah. their snake in a rack just say yeah. i want to keep my snake in a rack because just, i want to hold the whole thing it. and this is what i want to do just yeah. say it yeah. exactly just i don't admit understand it. why that's so hard like, because then I they mean, have to reckon with the fact that they keep a snake in a drawer they yeah. keep a snake in a drawer <laughs> mm -hmm. but if we all just live in la la land and tell each other termite mounds it's okay then nobody has to have bad feelings <laughs> just shows me that how the world is like when you don't have facts you go and attack right right if you don't have the data to back up right. what you're saying and somebody's coming at you with data how, what's what's your response your response is not to take a look inside yourself and say why am i doing what i'm doing <laughs> maybe like, i'm well, the what wrong is one. it why why am i why am i driven to 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 want to protect this side of things right and if mm. they were being honest i mean let's face it one of the guys is one of the big breeders in canada okay fair enough and he's doing it because <laughs> he wants to breed as a business and he has all these snakes and racks because it's easy to clean it's easy right. to, you know like all of those are justifications yes right. correct but it doesn't change the fact that there's data that says that that might not be the best for them and and they and the people that have the ball pythons and claim that all they do is live in a termite mound no they don't they climb trees so they crawl they if you go and look at the natural history of people that have put uh, you know telemetry devices and follow their movements these animals have big ranges and they're very active yeah but yeah, we can justify it because they're stupid and they don't have feelings and it doesn't matter yeah i'm not really sure what happened and why that changed in the last money. 10 years money, money yeah. the last 20 years yeah it's about keeping 
a large amount of animals in the smallest amount of space, hmm. not taking into consideration any of the feelings of the animal at all. Will they live? Yep. Will they breed? Yes. But breeding is not necessarily, it's, that's only one of the things you can use to, to, to prove that the animals are in, in, in pretty good shape. And it just means that they're in good health because breeding is a natural phenomenon that's only slightly different than eating or breathing. It's something that exactly. the animals do if they're healthy enough to do it. So, but that doesn't mean that they live a happy life and that they're not mentally ill. A lot of people think that ball pythons don't climb and rather they're pet rocks that just kind of sit on the bottom of their enclosure in a cave. And while they do hide a lot, they also climb a lot, we've found. After giving ours the opportunity to climb, she is climbing like all the time. So I think ball pythons really do utilize vertical space more than we think. Pet keepers, they are not breeders. They should not be encouraged to keep their snakes like breeders unless that snake cannot thrive in any other situation but the breeder situation because it didn't learn to do anything else. Because there's lots of fun appeal to having like a big enclosure with lots of visual interest and the snake yeah. can do more behaviors than he would in a rack and you can actually see them and you're like, oh, how are you? And go up here and he has like a full range of motion and that's better than being in a wreck. Uh, sorry to disappoint everyone in the chat. It's obviously better and more interesting for the snake. More stimuli, more thermal gradients, more textures. We do what we do because we need volume, not because that is the most humane condition. This is just reality. Breeders already know it. All we are doing is just telling you that the science backs them. But please don't conflate complete deprivation with no enrichment to going full bioactive in a massive enclosure. There is an in-between. If you go to my full talk, I quite clearly start talking about little ways to improve the lives of breeding bull pythons. Now, you can shift with strategy as a commercial breeder of bull pythons. Rather than view this science as impending doom, you can view it as an opportunity. Breeders can use enrichment as the tool it is to foster more cognitively switched on ball pythons that will be more able to cope with the stress that comes from transitioning from a rack to a more complex environment with more stimulus. You know, the transition that a pet home is likely to bring. As a breeder, you could use this information to educate your customers on how to make this transition as smoothly as possible. You're, the buyer will be more pleased with what they get. They got like a, an outgoing peppy corn snake that doesn't bite or a, a ball python that comes down and is like, yay, I'm going to periscope, be your best friend. If you could give them a very interactive snake right away, they don't have to have that, but that might engender in a pet buyer a better response. And then they might become a repeat customer. Don't we like that? We love that. Yeah, it's it's free acquisition. I have people that buy a snake for me every year at the same show. Then they come back and they're like, we're ready for a number whatever. We're ready for a number whatever. And every year they, they get a snake for me and it's it's beautiful. Okay. Now, the, the terminal condition of all snakes should hopefully be pets. Even the most high-end morph. A DG clown today will be a four hundred dollar snake in twenty years, or maybe maybe next year, based on how things are going. <laughs> but you know what I'm saying? Like you want snakes that are either born as neonates and placed in pet homes, or that retire from breeding facilities to be placed in pet homes. They like live males. so yes. long. Yeah. They live so long. They hopefully they are placed and they don't magically disappear and die or whatever and where all the male freezer. cinnamons <laughs> right so even a snake you're like well i don't need to like habituate this one to a lot of stimuli because it, it's really expensive it's just going to go breeder to breeder to breeder one day it will fall in price and become a pet or need to be rehomed as a pet so having snakes that are very tolerant of stimuli will benefit them in the end right but we already have snakes that grew up in less stimuli situations so we need to have plans to transition them whatever so that's what, so that's the, the goal we have animals that are growing up now that need more stimuli and animals that have already had like a less stimulating situation 
we need to work on methods to like build enrichment into the infrastructure we already have, maybe by new infra infrastructure that's more more uh, stimulating, but while still like balancing the fact that we're a commercial facility with commercial demands and density requirements to be a viable business. The other thing, which for some reason Paul Python people don't think that they can use, but you definitely can, is perches for babies in tubs. So people know about them for GTPs and carpets and boas, but a, a baby ball python will jump up on this. It's not like a crazy structure. Here's Heli Guy. He used to keep ball pythons. He's selling some. These are all 3D printed. So if we're like, what's a practical next step to buy to increase enrichment, maybe it's that. Now, this has to be congratulated. They saw the information, internalized it, understood it, and then saw the opportunity and ran with it. If you find the time, I would go watch this full live stream because they just get it. Now, there is an issue with breaking this rack cycle of ball pythons being cognitively deprived with neural atrophy and a generalized fearfulness struggling when put into a pet home. The issue is, for the most part, I'm not saying all, but there is a lack of knowledge on how to keep properly in a vivarium from the breeder side. You know, you need to have that knowledge to depart that knowledge upon your customer to begin with. I think... You should keep some of your species in the tub or enclosure or whatever that you think your buyer will keep them in to learn it yourself if you've never done it and then to teach them the right way when they ask you. So if you think ball pythons do best in a PVC enclosure, you should have at least one set up with a ball python in it so you can teach. This is again a really logical point made by Jessica. Jessica just gets it. Let's say a customer asks you, where should I put my thermostat probe in my vivarium? Should I use a pulse thermostat or a dimming thermostat? Which is the best type of E27 fitting to get? Where should I actually put my hides? Or even how to even modulate humidity in a larger environment or even how to clean it? If a breeder is watching this and if any of these questions makes you stumble and you think, what is Liam talking about? Then don't you think you ought to know? I completely agree with Jessica. Go get yourself a vivarium. Keep it, learn it, understand it. Then you have that knowledge to depart it. It's just such a good idea. It's just logical sense. The complete deprivation of darkness and just a water bowl with no enrichment does not survive into the future. And when push comes to shove and all the studies are going in one direction, there isn't a single study, mind you, that says, no, actually, they might do better in their acts. Every single study is going one direction. There is no future. I cannot see a future where that is defensible. It's indefensible and it will go under. We need and we should want to improve our baseline of animal welfare to an acceptable, defendable position before legislation removes our ability to keep altogether. Or even if they came in and said, right, these racks, there are minimum standards that you have to adhere to. Would you not rather have been working progressively to get better and building the infrastructure into a business to cope with that rather than like claw it out to the very end and then it be forced upon you when you can be years ahead and be like, oh yeah, I was doing this for ages. Surely that makes more sense. What's more defensible? Yes, we know the science actually, and we're working this into our infrastructure, and we're looking to put positive steps in place to be more progressive and get to a higher level of animal welfare. We all want that, versus, nah, they live in termite holes, um, and they need no nothing other than food and water, and you're an idiot if you say otherwise. If a certain subset of breeders refuse, outright refuse to accept reality and science, and they still want to tout the rack as the gold standard for bull python welfare, then they're going to be left behind. When Mr. Legislation comes knocking, good luck defending deprivation that goes against every study ever published with spouting personal remarks and the same old termite mound rhetoric. Good luck with that. Listen, the science doesn't disappear, nor its legitimacy lessen 
just because a certain subset of keepers have an emotional reaction to said science. If the science makes you feel a certain way, then look to these other breeders who are trying to lead the way now for how you can incorporate moving away from the extreme deprivation into your infrastructure, away from the deprivation that's causing the problem in the first place. And you completely have the power to do that, you just have to want to. Like, it's weird. Like, just skirting over, like, royal pythons, Tortoises. Tortoises are, are, are another one which people suffer from folklore husbandry really bad. We've got a customer who comes, oh, my granny used to keep it, used to feed it dog food, and da 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 da. And we're like, what? No, don't do that. Well, I didn't need to do this when I kept them X amount of years ago. It's like, well, things have moved on now. So, you know, and I think royal python breeders need to do the same.